what does it mean to stay in your lane these days? Thanks to rapid cultural and technological advances in every medium, convergence has become crucial to survival. No one can exist in silos. In order to thrive, visionaries must harness the power of partnership and collaboration. Today, we've gathered a panel of titans. These leaders conquered their respective fields, then knocked down the boundaries through innovation. They learned when and how to combine forces to produce projects that have pushed the culture further, faster, with lucrative reward. This is Complex Conversations, disrupting the future, how collaboration propels culture with your host, Mouse Jones. We would not be here if it was not for this man. So I need everybody to make some noise for the CEO of Complex, Rich Antonello. Thank you. Next up, please put your hands together for the one, the only, Hype Williams. Thank you for the intro. Next up, y'all put your hands together for Steve Stout. All right, y'all make some noise for Idris Sandu. Last and certainly not least, y'all make some noise for Ronnie Five. These, these five people all are doing and have been doing things in this community and this culture to ensure that we are here today and will go further on into the future. Um, Idris, I wanna ask you, what are some of the fields younger kids uh, growing up right now, what should they be looking to prepare for uh, getting into those industries? You know, we're starting to see uh, a digital revolution and we're starting to see a lot of industries um, that a lot of college students wanna go into being you know, um, fused with technology, no matter what you want to go into. The old me would have said, oh, like, you need to go STEM, like, learn science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, right? But now the new me is saying that, you know, prepare for the digital revolution and equip yourself. Um, take the skill sets that you get from school, from community, from your elders and people that have been in the technological or technology industry, but also you know, teach yourself a lot of these things. We created more data in the last two years than the entire human existence. There's so many resources, there's so much stuff online that you can go to and literally teach yourself and go at your own pace. That's the advantage we have now. You know, you can sit in the classroom and be around so many different people and we can go on this whole aptitude thing, which is we're going to teach everybody the same thing at the same time with the same, you know, amount of uh, resources or I can just go home and pick up these other resources. So when it comes to things like t uh, coding, when it comes to things like uh, science, you know, technology, go on the tangent of like, you know, learning from people around you, but also self-education and self-information is, you know, really hot right now. And that's what everybody's doing. And for me, that's how I started. Um, a lot of my friends, we often use the term um, information and exposure more so than education, because in 2018, um, we can't yeah. solely rely on education. Education can keep you uninformed the moment your, edu your educator becomes uninformed. But if, you ex if you're exposed to the raw information, you can choose what you want to do with it. Now, Steve, shout out to you, fellow New Yorker. You, you got translation right now um, and, a, and a shit ton of other things. So what are some of the skills that you're looking for in some of these upcoming um, personalities or even employees uh, to further what you're doing right now? I think the only way that you can disrupt, and we were talking about this backstage a bit, um, industries going forward, is the absolute convergence of culture, technology, and storytelling. So, and every single person inside the company must be well versed on two or three of those things and have empathy for the third part, right? So if you're a culture guy, you can't be looking at the tech guys like they're not cool and all that bullshit. And if you're the guy who knows HTML, you can't look at the guy who's steeped in culture and be like, yeah, fuck him. You have to really, truly understand that you guys are codependent. And then the storytellers amplify what you guys create. The companies that I want to build going forward, if disruption is truly what we need to do in order to expand marketplaces, then you need to have those skill sets. It's critical. Now, I'm going to ask all, all five of you, where do you see this culture, this community, where do you see it going in the next five to 10 years? My viewpoint, it's kind of funny, it's not where this culture is going to go. I think the question is actually flawed. Instead of being kind of looked at on the fringes the way we used to be, I think that 
that, that we're gonna be defining where it goes. A lot of things to kind of create. You guys have the entry points are so, the fragmentation and segmentation is unlike anything that's yeah, ever seen. Absolutely. So go grab it and then fucking define where, the, what, where you wanna put that flagpole. What about you, Hype? Most of what I've been able to do that I feel people uh, still appreciate now it's come through unplanned collaborations. And it's the way Steve described what he's doing moving forward with his company is, is creating an environment for that to happen. Right. Culture is now, because of many different things, it can, be get, it can get homogenized. And I remember just that whole term of culture vulture came out when Damon Dash said it. And it was like, really, who's doing that? And I'm concerned that the culture ends up turning to 2% milk or Diet Coke or whatever, because people are running around saying, do it for the culture, and, do it, and they don't really mean it at all. Mm. They just say it because oh. it's in vogue. And that's, you guys gotta protect that. I always go back to this era in 1980, around 1988, 89, with, M with MTV before Hype Williams took it over, and there was, <laughs> uh, rock and roll was big, but then what happened was there was hair bands, guys that were just, wear long hair, and just act like they were doing rock, and then people would buy it. And that ended up becoming slowly the death of rock and roll. You know, 20 years ago, whenever it was, when we did the, the Jada Kiss Allen Iverson commercial, Hype Williams shot it. Like, nobody, Jada Kiss wasn't famous like that. But it was important, but he was culturally so relevant that it mattered. And I cared more about doing that, and we cared about doing that, more than we cared about getting a famous guy to do it at the time. And it's not about, I, I believe in this whole entire theory that we're going through right now, there's a war taking place between fame versus talent. Yeah. We cannot let fame win. If you are on the side of culture and you are a supporter and a believer of culture, you just can't let fame just dominate the conversation. Talent must matter. Culture is a very important part of talent, and we must respect it and protect it. I just, same, same question. You know, when I was sitting here, it was like an outer, uh, outer body experience because I'm looking at all these legends give their take to the masses, to me, right? This is like the mass. This is like the real world. This is Instagram here. And what we're going to start seeing is the shift from tech brands looking at, oh, like, the, te the culture works for us, it's gonna flip now. It's gonna be the technology works for the culture. And we're going to start seeing self-exposure because right now, you sitting right there, you have more access to anybody in the 19th or the 18th century might have right in your hands. Everybody can make a video right now and reach millions of people. And so we're going to start seeing a lot of people taking essentially not power, but uh, information and diverting it in the right way. And we're all going to sit. A lot down. of the tech companies mm -hmm. are culture vultures. They are. Yeah, that's they, a lot <laughs> like, of them. I'm going to break the ice. I'm going to yeah, just say you, it. You're saying a bunch of things. <laughs> like, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's what they, they are. They're not, they're not giving back to the people who've actually made these platforms popular. No, it's worse than that. Um, they're using this. And, then, and, and then they don't even, and then they do it and they have no concern for what, the implications are. I'm like over here taking notes, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Like this is all, uh, everything being spoken about is super true. And I think that we've all had, we all have our own perspective on the culture and how we want to see it move forward. But the one thing I want to talk about is the word substance. You know what I'm saying? Cause I feel like that's the most important word for me when working on anything today. It's like, I have this like challenge with everything that I do in trying to educate the consumer on what they're actually buying. You know what I'm saying? Um, and because I'm a firm believer in substance, it's been you know, a challenge to have to reinvent to tell a message or to tell a story. You know, but Steve and I actually, um, I was at Steve's apartment last week and we had a conversation uh, about how it's, a, it's about the 13 to 17 year old and you know, Steve actually brought that up. And like, if they, you know, it's what, it's what you love between those ages that really keeps you um, passionate, you know, about all of those things for the rest of your life. 
like what you're interested in, you know, for the rest of your life. And that's, and, and thinking back on that, like those were the years that were most impactful in my life. And those are the things I'm still trying to project today, you know, but I think I'm having a hard time seeing how much less things mean because information is moving so fast, right? But the problem is people are more interested in, you know, what's the hottest thing today than what is, you know, what has the most substance? What should I really be, um, what should I really be looking into and what should I be passionate about? People are, I feel like a lot of the, gener the younger generation having, speaking about my, my nephews even, you know, my nephews are uh, 12, 14 and 16. And, you know, I'm always, I'm constantly asking them about how they feel about certain things. And I feel like there's like this void in their emotional connection to things, to, to, yeah. to either to brands or mm -hmm. to people or to product because, you know, they, they, they come and go because the talent is not what they're looking for, you know? They're looking for the cover of a book instead of actually reading through it, you know? So mm. like, and it, and it all started, you know, and obviously uh, we all use Instagram as a tool. It's all about how you use it, but the viewer for the most part is using it incorrectly. You know, they're just, uh, they're not digesting information properly today because it's moving so fast. You know, I think the, for the, I think what's gonna happen, and your question is what is it gonna look like for the next five years? I think what's gonna happen is gonna be a correction because just like anything, I feel like it's a bubble that's gonna burst, you know, when things are just moving at the fastest pace to where things don't matter at all anymore. You know, people are gonna go back the way they have with vinyl you know, into wanting to touch and feel things that mean something to them. Things have to have a sentimental value to people. When we're talking about collaborations, when do you know, or what is it about the thing that, that, that you say, I wanna collaborate with that, with you? I, what is, the, what is the, the biggest thing that, that, that sticks out to you and you're like, yo, that's what I wanna, that's what I wanna merge my brand with? I was in love with what I was doing. Right. And that's kind of, it drove all my decision-making process. Does that make any yeah. sense? So I, I, I dove in, I, get, I did my best because of love. That sounds real crazy to everybody, I'm nah, sure. You see home. it, in the, you bad. feel it in the work though. You feel it, it's so. It's, well, I think, I think that's a part of this idea of timelessness that everybody's talking about. Like how do you keep something relevant because of all of that stuff that we're talking about that, that everyone says that I did, it was all done out of love. That's the challenge to get people to love things, yeah. right? Like to get people to be excited right. and to love and be passionate about the things that they want to do. For me, when I first, and when I got into the advertising business, for instance, I left the music business and I got into the advertising business, people thought I was crazy. Still I was, real. huh? <laughs> well, they, well, I, was, I, I, was, I was running Interscope Records and it was super Talk successful. About. So why would you leave that and go into the advertising business? And what I seen back then, um, it still exists today, was advertising companies trying to snatch what the culture was doing and then put it in television commercials. And it would look like them having some fake guy rapping over a Honey Nuts Cheerios commercial or something stupid like that. And I'd be sitting there watching it going, <laughs> I could definitely fix this. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to get into the business. Again, Hype was with me back then when I first got into business because I felt like we could disrupt this industry that was telling these terrible stories trying to depict our culture. And I didn't know if we was ever going to make money doing it. But I knew the responsibility was to protect the culture, first and foremost, and B, disrupt this stupidity from happening before it goes any further. One of the things that I'm very focused on disrupting is the presence of the major label music uh, distribution situation. I, 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 I never understood why um, artists would not own their works. Um, it never made any sense to me. And then when everything went digital, it became super clear that they didn't need anybody in the middle to own their works anymore. Because the physical part of carrying records to record stores and shipping them and pressing vinyl and CDs, you didn't need that any longer. So why, it, why isn't social media the new MTV and Apple and Spotify the new Tower Records? 
Like, that's it. <laughs> you don't need the guy in the middle anymore. You promote yourself, you get yourself hot, you put your music out, and then you can stream it. So that's what United Mass is. That's the intent. And I need everybody's support around that mission. Um, and again, that's, that's putting technology and culture and storytellers together. That's why I took the advertising agency. I started this music distribution company. And my only goal is to get rid of the middleman so that the artist can actually flourish off of their art. The one thing that I, we were talking about is collaborations and the purity and what works and what doesn't. You know, it's kind of funny, um, and, it, and it's talk about like the bad behaviors of agencies and clients and how, you know, a while the collaboration culture got really fucking bad, like really bad, because it was like based on somebody's scale or well, like the scale of their fucking social. And let's just slam this again. We'll, way, trade, I, we'll it, trade fan bases and shit like that. It happened, it happened like in music that. too. Like 100%. Bad collaborations in music. Like this pop artist wants to work with this thing. Like Katy Perry and Amigos. Like why the fuck does anyone <laughs> want to listen to that? Because she's trying to get hot. But we, the word I was looking for with you guys about when collabs make sense is shared values. Right? When you have shared values, you're not doing it for anything other than the fact that you have shared values is when those things work. Can I ask, can I ask Hype a question real quick? I just want to know something. When you were working on those music videos, was it always in the back of your mind to make them as different as possible? Like, was it, was it like you knew what was happening and you wanted to make sure that it didn't look anything like anything else? To be honest, man, no, I, I was just winging it. You know, like... <laughs> Good. Complex Con, this has been Disrupting the Future with Ronnie Feig, Idris Sandu, Steve Stout, the legendary Hype Williams, Rich Antonello. And Mouse! I've been your host, Mouse Jones. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you.